Hello, I'm Kemal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, Nigeria, once the best military in West Africa, but now struggling to fend off the threat of Boko Haram. As Nigeria approaches crucial elections, we uncover why successive governments have starved the military of cash. Also this week, the Afghan city that's an economic model for the rest of the country. But while it's relatively untouched by the Taliban, Herat has another problem to deal with, kidnappings, which are now a big threat to the economy. And as China's economy slows, its banks are bailing out the property developers. This is one new city, but without one very important element, the people. So imagine a country which is the biggest economy on its continent, which has the biggest army in the region and which spends a fifth of its budget on security. Well, that country is Nigeria, and yet for some reason the army seems incapable of properly taking on the ongoing threat of Boko Haram. Is it a lack of will or is it a lack of means? Well, perhaps it's the latter. As we look at this 12-year period from 2001 to 2012, it shows, all told, that the Nigerian military received $19 billion in that period. But as we put this next line in over the top, which is GDP, you'll see that yearly that is only around 1% of GDP even falling um, to below half a percent in 2006. Remembering, on average, nations typically spend about 2% of GDP on military. Now look at this number here. We've got $5.8 billion. This is from the last budget when Nigeria spent that much on security. That's a quarter of the budget, so again, it looks like a good number. But some of that money has allegedly fueled corruption or been siphoned off to enrich regional governments. Now, of the $5.8 billion, roughly a third went to the Defence Ministry. And we break it down like this, $830 million uh, for the Army. The Navy gets in the region of $440 million. And the Air Force, $460 million. On top of that, there's another $400 million spent on deployments and missions. So why? Why starve the military of money? Well, maybe it's because since independence from Britain in the 1960s, Nigeria's had four military coups with the last an attempted coup in 1990. You drip feed the money, you gradually neutralize that coup threat. But what it also leads to is an under-resourced military, short of guns and ammunition. It's allowed a group like Boko Haram to extend its influence to the point of threatening national elections. They are coming at the end of the month, but were postponed for six weeks so the army could take on Boko Haram. Where Nigeria spent a lot is the more prosperous Niger Delta, the place where there is a lot of oil. It's estimated over a five-year period to 2008, oil theft and militant attacks have cost the country about $100 billion. So, of course, more attention will go there. Well, let's try to dig a little further into this with our featured guest this week on Counting the Cost. He is the Nigerian retired Major General Ishola Williams, uh, who is now the Executive Secretary of the Pan-African Strategic and Policy Research Group. He's in Lagos for us. Mr. Williams, thank you for your time. What has, in your opinion, gone wrong with the Nigerian army? It was strong for a long time, but appears to have been starved of funding. Oh, I think um, with respect to Nigerian army and most of the armies in Africa, you could recollect that um, anybody who had been following the events in the 1970s, when there were a series of coup d'etats in Africa. And then most of the Western countries at that time were now saying that we don't want any more coup d'etats in Africa. We now want democratic system to be part and parcel of African development. Hmm. And therefore they said, cut down the size of your army, reduce your budget to a certain percentage of your GDP and concentrate your, your, your effort mm. on social issues and social development. So when you then have a situation in which we're having since um, the late 90s and the early 2000, you now find that the, the armies are totally unprepared for what they are facing. And this is why we have the situation that we have today. And uh, up to now, what do you see? Instead of these African armies thinking that true, what could be done, they are so dependent on Western help that whenever there's any problem, they run to the United States, they run to EU. Those ones will bring in trainers, bring in equipment, help them with intelligence. So how do you want the army themselves to grow, to be able to tackle some of these problems? And most of the global problems that we have, 
we must find local solutions to them because all this help cannot continue forever. And the African armies must sit up and see and come together and see what they can do themselves. It just seems though, Mr. Williams, that everything's been too uh, yeah. reactionary. You know? No, no, what I mean is that it's, it's, it, it's sort of, oh, we need to postpone the elections because of the threat of Boko Haram. There needs to be, I would think, some sort of long-term idea to properly get the army back to where it was. No, 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 but uh, people tend to forget that the uh, Nigerian army was not built to fight counterinsurgency guerrilla warfare or counter-terrorism. That's what it was built. Most of the Afghan armies are offshoot of colonial armies. And they were just built on conventional structures, okay? And uh, nobody even thought about 10, 15 years ago, even though some of us in the army at that time, about 20, 25 years ago, were thinking that in case we could face this sort of situation we have today, I haven't had experiences of the Mesa Sine in 1987. But people did not take us seriously. Even most of the Western countries never thought that this sort of thing could happen. And since so we copy, you know, blindly what is happening in the Western, uh, you know, military structures, we just went along the line. We were buying the wrong equipment and following the wrong doctrine. So when this thing came on us, we were totally unprepared. The second thing is that the, 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 the war of today, especially the non-conventional warfare, intelligence is the leading is a leading element. Mm. What has happened in this is that the African armies have used the advantage they have in terms of human intelligence. And therefore, our doctrine and structures must think bottom up from the community defense, community intelligence gathering system up to the top. And that means that everything that we have been taught in war college and staff colleges and things like that must change completely with respect to African armies who want to fight non-conventional warfare. What about the idea that the army, or rather the government, I should say, focused too hard uh, on the Niger Delta? Obviously, there has been a lot of violence there. <coughs> there has been kidnappings. But these types of things happen because, quite simply, there is a lot of oil there. Now, has the money gone there and the government spent all its time and money there and then opened up other areas almost, which Boko Haram and groups like that have been able to uh, exploit, as it were? No, no, no. We could have a balance of the two, really, because um, at the time, Boko Haram was intensifying his uh, attacks and everything. The one on Niger Delta was sort of quietening down, actually with the amnesty introduced by the late President Yaradua. Okay. But even talking about the case of, uh, of Niger Delta, Niger Delta to me was a stupid war. It was something that needed a political solution, not a military solution. And if they had tackled it, Politically, we couldn't have had the sort of problem that we had because since 1947, there's a Wilkin report that said that Niger Delta would be a problem. 1947. Mm. And it needed a political problem. And oil is still creating some sort of political problem. It's not a military problem at all. And it's continued to be a stupid war that we are fighting. Mm. The second most important thing is this is that if you are having a legal bunkering and it's still going on, it means that there are some top people at the top level, like everybody knows, that are involved. That thing about illegal refineries. So why don't you have what you call artisanal refinery? Artisanal refinery, most of these people who are involved in this illegal refinery, as you call it, we do artisanal refinery. It's just like people keep talking about illegal mining. That's not like illegal mining. If you go to Zimbabwe, you see artisanal mining. I mean, other countries have copied that. And it's working very well think outside the box, period. Retired Major General Ishola Williams joining us uh, from Lagos. A few technical problems there, but we do thank you for your time. Now, while we're talking money in Africa, there's an interesting story here which actually ties in the United Kingdom. So a new law has been passed there ensuring the overseas aid budget is protected every year. But pressure groups reckon there's a reason the UK likes aid so much, that it's actually a cover for corporations to tighten their grip in Africa. Lawrence Lee has this special report for counting the cost. A night in watching TV, hardly a luxury, but in the Nigerian capital Abuja, you can't take anything for granted. Inua and her son are left fumbling in the darkness. The blackouts happen all the time, and it isn't just TV that's affected. Life is more expensive. You cannot um, um, store um, food, basic food things in the freezer anymore. 
and so that means you have to buy you have to buy um, food items on a daily basis to cook. Nigeria's energy system is dysfunctional. Billions have been spent trying to provide basic power to people in a country that's full of oil, but a mixture of corruption and disorganisation has left huge numbers without guaranteed supplies. Half a world away in London, the British government has been watching all this with interest. Its ministry with responsibility for aid hired a company to help sort out Nigeria's energy problem. But rather than offer aid, they propose that Nigeria's energy sector should be sold off to private investors. A whole series of reforms were required, uh, both to try and um, make, uh, firstly, the existing system work slightly better in terms of procurement, to fix uh, the issue of uh, availability of gas, to create a market for power, and also um, to attract private investment. About $100 billion is required to expand the system, and that can't come from the state, even if they were capable of spending it without there being massive corruption. So the only alternative is to bring it in from private, private investors. Supporters of privatization argue that it can stop countries having to rely on aid. The case against it is that aid has no place in helping big corporations get their hands on Africa. What happened um, in the minds of some politicians, I think, is, well, actually, now we have this budget ring fence, let's use it for the kind of things that we believe in. And so if you look at what a lot of um, the aid budget is being used for today, um, it's being used to support big corporations taking over land and food systems in Africa, uh, energy systems. Um, it's being used to build luxury um, apartments and hotels under this premise that really was discredited many years ago now, that wealth trickles down. We asked the Department for International Development repeatedly for an interview. We didn't get one. Throughout several years of national austerity, the government here has remained defiantly committed to the aid budget. It now ring fences nearly 1% of all the money the country makes every year to international aid. But the question is, if any of that money goes to advising foreign governments on what might be construed as political initiatives, is it actually aid? There are other examples of this happening in different places. In Tanzania, for example, a flagship scheme to provide the water supply for millions of people collapsed. Opponents of the Nigeria Power Project say there's no guarantee it will work any better. But the company that brokered the deal suggests the scheme plays into a bigger thought process about political stability in places like Nigeria. Aid is about development uh, more than anything else. So to develop Nigeria such that the people come out of poverty, we have stability and security, that is the critical part of our, of our spending. The alternative perhaps might be for the country to collapse into um, confusion and civil war. Whether that's true or not, Nigeria's newly privatised electricity is having an uncertain beginning. In Newer and her sons still rely on the generator when the lights go off, even though since privatisation, the price of their electricity has gone up. Lawrence Lee for Counting the Cost in London. And still ahead on Counting the Cost, a cut above the rest, even with the financial turmoil. Diamond prices, unlike gold and other commodities, are on the rise. We'll find out why a little later on. For now, though, we look at Afghanistan, specifically Herat, which has been largely untouched by the war in the rest of the country. It's on the border with Iran and Turkmenistan, which helps as far as trade and prosperity goes. But Herat's economic growth has been held back by a growing trade in kidnappings. Nicole Johnston has this report. It's a quiet trip around the block. Haji Basir with his boys, Ifam and Khumeyun, and an armed bodyguard. This is how well-off families in Herat get around these days. Three years ago, Irfan was kidnapped. He was six years old. His father now carries a gun and can't stop worrying about his family's safety. The boys had been on a school bus when three men shot the tyres and dragged Irfan out of his brother's arms and off the bus. They demanded $300,000. The family didn't have that much, so the kidnappers dropped the ransom to $50,000. Irfan was freed after 86 days. 
Before Irfan was kidnapped, he was naughty, fast and bright. After, he became withdrawn. If the bodyguard isn't with him all the time, he gets frightened. He tells me they'll take us again. Herat is a prosperous city. The Taliban is active in the countryside, but not the town. Here the problem is organised criminal gangs. One of the main reasons Herat has become a target for criminal gangs is because it's full of businessmen. It's a major trading hub with neighbouring Iran. Now this road leads all the way to the Iranian border and Herat is the first big city you reach after the crossing. More than 100 people were killed in Herat last year in so-called targeted assassinations. Kidnappings are also common, but out of fear, most people don't report it. This year, President Ashraf Ghani fired the Herat Chief of Police and all 15 district chiefs in a mass sacking. He said they'd failed to establish security. The new police chief says they need to build up trust with the community to get more information about criminal gangs. The terrorist groups, kidnappers and so-called Taliban, they are not as strong as Afghan security forces. They are small groups operating in a guerrilla way. But if the community cooperates, the criminals are nothing. Now, housing is a crucial engine of growth for many economies. Even in China, the so-called factory of the world, housing makes up 15% of the economy. So when it goes wrong, it's noticeable. Harry Fawcett has the story of property developers feeling the pain in China. There's not much construction going on at the Tsinghua Fudi construction site. The estate agent says it's just a seasonal pause while the ground is frozen. But she admits they've decided not to put any apartments up for sale yet. A few years ago, some developers ran away with their investors' money, so that's why people are nervous. Our boss is a local man. He wants to finish everything before selling to try to reassure buyers. This is how it's going to look, homes for government workers perhaps, when the local government moves here. But for now, there's little more life on the streets of Yingkou than there is in the model. As of three years ago, the government was already having to cover $1.6 billion in bad debt as developments failed. If the present is the future, then there can't be much prospect of getting that money back. So it's Sunday afternoon in Yinko's main park, and what do you know, I've got the place entirely to myself. Across China, local governments have been betting on grand projects just like this one. Across China, ghost towns just like this one have been emerging as a result. Since Al Jazeera was last in Yinko in the summer, the national government has been trying to tackle the problem of oversupply and falling property prices. But two interest rate cuts later, selling property in Yinko hasn't got any easier. In the bustling old town, there's little appetite for a move to the empty skyscrapers up the road. The new town is not as convenient and busy as here in the old town. In fact, it's here that you find a successful mega project. One of China's biggest developers is spending nearly a billion dollars on a mall, office and apartment complex. 900 apartments sold already. The management say they would never have invested here if they believed the government were really going to relocate. If the government stays put, then Yinko's new town looks consigned to its fate. Its creation was approved by China's premier, Li Keqiang, when he was provincial governor here. Now his task is to stop its collapse being repeated across China's vital but shaky property sector. Finally this week, diamonds, one of very few, perhaps the only luxury commodity that has risen in price in recent times. Global diamond sales grew 3% to a new record of $81 billion, with the strongest growth coming from the US, China and India. So if there's a company that's really benefited from this, it's probably De Beers, which produces a third of the world's rough diamonds by value. The thing is, finding those diamonds is getting tougher because, simply put, the easy-to-find diamonds have already been dug up. Joining us from London is the CEO of De Beers, Philippe Millier. Thank you for your time today. Just tell us broadly, what is the reason you believe that the price of diamonds has held up so well? Are they getting more difficult to find as well? Is there a scarcity factor which leads to them being uh, well-priced as well? 
Yes, and uh, it's not going to get easier. Uh, no new mines have been discovered in the last 20 to 25 years. Uh, the beers will open the next big mine at the end of 2016, and after that there is no more project. So uh, we are forecasting a slow decline of the rough diamond production from 2019 around that, and after that slow decline. So uh, there will be, and everybody is saying the same thing, a gap opening between supply and demand in the, in the very foreseeable future. No new mines for 20 to 25 years. That sounds quite extraordinary to me. What is, uh, is this just a natural phenomenon or not looking in the right places? No, we are looking at the right place and the beers has been uh, very involved for the last 125 years. Uh, diamonds are found into old volcanic pipes uh, and they are very, very old. So they are only found in the, uh, in the oldest parts of the earth uh, crust. So uh, we can't find them uh, everywhere. We can find them in the south of the hemisphere in southern Africa, on top of Earth, uh, close to the North Pole in Canada and in, in Russia, and a little bit around some places of Africa and Australia. Just to give you an example of the rarity of diamonds, uh, De Beers has discovered in the last 125 years 7,000 pipes, so 7,000 volcanic pipes with the potential uh, to have diamonds in them and only 10 out of 7,000 became mines. Tell me about where you're selling the most, who's buying the most? The biggest uh, market, and has always been the case, is the, the US. In right. the US, 42% uh, of the, the diamond jewelry is being sold there. Uh, and it has always been the biggest market. It was the first market to open to diamond jewelry, and it's still a, a very big market for us. Mm -hmm. Slightly less than 50% of the world market, very mature market, which was open 70, 80 years ago. Right but still growing. And today we are releasing numbers which are very positive and reassuring because despite the fact that the US is the biggest market, the most mature market, it is still the market growing the fastest. That's mm. quite interesting. It is. I want to ask you about some other regions, Botswana in particular. You've talked about Africa already, but Botswana is interesting because it actually owns 15% of your company. Now, obviously, they're looking for a return yeah. on investment. Can you explain to us how you're doing that? Because the, the, the common thread with companies coming into Africa is that usually they're just coming in there to take the resources and take the money and go. Are you doing something to counter yeah. that, particularly given the government's investment in you? No, it's, uh, I think the Beers has always been involved with local communities, with uh, local government it is part of our DNA uh, if we look at our supply uh, just to give you a big picture we mine around 33 million carat per year as an average let's say more than 20 million 21 22 million carats are coming from Botswana mm. and we are mining together in Botswana uh, with the uh, shared company with the government of Botswana called Debswana 50 50 and in Namibia we are mining together with the government of the Republic of Namibia, a 50-50 joint venture, slightly less than 2 million carats. So we have been together with Botswana for the last 45 years, so it's not something which started yesterday. It's one of the most successful public-private partnership in the world, and thanks to this partnership, Botswana in less than 40 years went from one of the poorest countries in Africa to maybe one of the wealthiest by, uh, by uh, inhabitants. So, but but, but uh, does wealthy mean people have got jobs, they've got, they've got some stability in their life? Because I think that's more important than a, than a number, is whether there are jobs for people out there. Yes, and the government has been very, very careful in planning what to do uh, with the money coming from Diamond to build infrastructure, to build hospital, to give free education, to good medical, give good medical care. And we are working together. That's part of the beneficiation program we have with the government of the Republic of Botswana, but also with Namibia. Uh, we are creating jobs locally to cut and polish diamonds and now to, to go down the value chain and work into jewellery. Philippe Melia, very interesting talking to you. We thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. And that is our show for this week, but there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash ctc. That'll take you straight to our page. You can catch up on previous episodes there, including last week's special panel discussion on women in the energy sector. You can also get in touch with us. You can tweet either me at Kamal AJE. Our business editor is there as well, at Abid Oliver Ali. And do use the hashtag uh, AJCTC when you tweet us or drop us an email.
Counting the Cost at aljazeera.net is the address. But that is it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.